Welcome, and thank you all for being here for a discussion about documentary photography and activism. The first of three panel discussions connected to the Gage Gallery's current virtual exhibition, Black Summer, Race, Resistance, and Resilience. My name is Mike Ensdorf, and I teach photography in the Journalism and Media Studies program here at Roosevelt University. And I'm also the founder and director of the Gage Gallery at Roosevelt. I'm delighted to introduce tonight's moderator and Black Summer's guest curator, Vanessa Charlo, who will then introduce this evening's panelists. Vanessa Charlo is a Haitian American documentary photographer, filmmaker, lecturer, and emerging curator working in Miami, Florida, and St. Louis, Missouri. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in English Literature and Sociology from Florida Atlantic University. In her work, Vanessa explores the immutability of the collective human experience by aesthetically disrupting compositional hierarchy through the use of primarily black and white images. She focuses on the intersectionality of spirituality, socioeconomic issues, sexual slash gender expression within marginalized communities. The purpose of her work is to produce visual representations of varied human existences that are free of an oppressive gauge, gaze. Her photographs have been published in the New York Times, Oprah Magazine, Vogue, The New Yorker, Rolling Stone, The Atlantic, New York Magazine, The Guardian, Artnet News, BuzzFeed, Apple, and other publications. And now I'll turn it over to Vanessa. Hi, everyone. Um, I was absolutely delighted when Mike um, invited me to curate uh, a very, very important exhibition, I believe, and that it this exhibition um, sought to uh, visually capture um, a historic moment in, in our lifetime, which was the protest of 2020. So Black Summer, that, include, that goes into race, resistance, and resilience. Um, the, the purpose of the exhibit is to provide an intimate look into Black communities during the height of the protest of 2020. The other purpose was to humanize Black life in America. I think oftentimes when we were engaging and watching what was happening in the streets, um, the stories of everyday Black people and their allies were not coming to light. And so this exhibit um, seeks to do that. Lastly, um, it is to show the the power and impact of centering the black bodies in photographs and how that completely disrupts uh, the photographic landscape. So I decided to engage with 11 photographers of color around the United States um, that were doing amazing work. And I am honored this evening to be introducing Three of, the three of the photographers that will be discussing their work. Um, the first gentleman is Gary Berrigan. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I'm Gary Berrigan. Um, uh, I was brought on to this project by Vanessa. It's a great um, honor to be here to be selected amongst the, um, the 10 other photographers here. Uh, last year, as we know, like changed everybody's lives, whether it's the pandemic or the social justice movement, whatnot, um, myself was no different. I, nor, I am not a visual journalist by, by trade per se. Um, I normally, my main wheelhouse is headshots and portraits, but seeing how how close to home it was hitting um being in louisville kentucky and with brianna taylor being one of the epicenters next to the um, george floyd protest um I, I felt like i had a calling um literally it's like i was just thinking to myself either i could just kind of be quiet and sit in my studio and just ignore what's going on and just try to keep the business as usual or um i could take these tools and 
the skills I have and go out on the streets and document what I've seen was going on. Um, and then from there, we kind of came multi-layered from, from there. Like I was starting to see how social media was being manipulated or mainstream media was being manipulated. So you had like a group of live streamers and photographers on the ground who were telling the stories versus stuff you'd see on the mainstream news, which sometimes wasn't always telling the truth or leaving parts out that can shift the story one way or the other. And then being a third generation American or second generation American and third generation military um, kind of grew to um, like it was like my civic duty to just stay out there and try to do what I can as far as documenting the movie, the movement and trying to bring truth to what was happening here in Louisville, Kentucky. Thank you so much for that, Gary. Um, the second photograph, the second photographer that we're going to introduce is Chris <laughs> Face. Good evening, good evening. Hi, Chris. What's up? What's up? What's up? <laughs> for having me, Gary. What's going on, man? What's going on? Yeah, um, I'll tell you a little bit about me, but uh, before I get into that, I just want to say rest in peace to all the Black Lives Lost to police brutality that we had to deal with last year that kind of sparked everything off with this. So I want to get that, start that off right out the way. Secondly, I'm Chris Facey. I'm a portrait and documentary photographer based here in Brooklyn, New York. A lot of my work is based on breaking stereotypes within the black community and how other communities also see us. I'm also working on breaking stereotypes amongst black dads and things of that nature, always really pushing for a positive, accurate visual representation of black communities and black culture. I'm also a current senior at the School of Visual Arts and because of the pandemic, my graduation will be online so everybody's invited. Wonderful, thank you for the invitation, Chris. <laughs> um, lastly, um, I'll be introducing uh, Tony Mobley. Hello everyone. Vanessa, uh, thanks so much for having all of us on this panel, uh, this so important panel uh, in light of what we all experienced and documented uh, last year during the uh, Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, as Vanessa stated, my name is Tony Mobley. I am a freelance photojournalist based in Washington, D.C. Um, I've actually been shooting uh, for quite a while since I was a kid, but uh, actually started up professionally again in 2012, uh, where I used to shoot actually concerts. And that kind of morphed into me actually shooting uh, local demonstrations and protests here uh, in the city of D.C. And uh, yeah, last year, I just felt it was my, my civic duty uh, as well to go out and document our people uh, who are, as you all know, are in a continued struggle, uh, stating from the beginning of time, since the beginning of time, in terms of us being brought here as kings and queens uh, from Africa. Uh, so the struggle continues, and I just felt uh, compelled to go out and document, um, like I said, our folks in the best way possible. And so again, thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. So all, all of you three have mentioned that <clears throat> felt completely moved and compelled to document what was happening last year. Starting with Chris, why did you think as a photographer of color, it was so important to use your work um, as a form of visual activism as well? It's a good question. Um, I think it's important because who's better to tell black stories other than a black person, a black photographer, a black videographer, somebody that's already involved in the movement that is in fully support of this. For a long time, our, our history has been told by other non-black people and they, they usually get it wrong. And those inaccuracies causes other people to start coming up with their own stereotypes or being able to mold the story how they want it to go. And most times in my experience, it hasn't always been positive. And when you have people that's not part of that community tell that story, there's that gap. There's a whole big gap of not, of not understanding. And if us black photographers don't really get in there to do that, we leave room for somebody else to talk about our history again. So I, I absolutely agree with that. I think that um, history is often told from the position of the victor and not the victim. 
right? And so it is imperative that whenever we're telling stories, you have to think about who does the story benefit? Um, and is it presenting um, whoever in the most authentic light possible? And so I, I agree. I think it is, it is critical that um, more photographers of color begin to reflect what's actually happening in their communities in order to shape the narrative. Um, Gary, I know that you are based in Louisville and Louisville was a hotbed um, last year with the unfortunate death of Breonna Taylor. Um, what was that like for you uh, documenting your community and how were you able to um, maintain the integrity in your work in such a, a conflicted situation like that? Um, well, it was, it was like a roller coaster, honestly. There were some intense moments, you know, with everything going on um, between the protests and the police. And then at sometimes the, uh, the white militia, there was a couple of times the white militia came to town. Um, so it was really intense. Like it was, it, it was intense, but also there was rewarding moments. There were moments of, um, like happiness and joy. Like I, I would try to go down there. Like my studio isn't that far from downtown. So if I was down there working, I got done with my work or my session, I would head over to the square, you know, just document what's going on. And, you know, sometimes it'd just be people like hanging out, having fun, having good conversations. They had a garden there. They were planting. Um, it was, I believe it was called uh, Roots for Brianna. Um, and one day I caught a water balloon fight. So and I thought that, that was pretty, pretty nice. It was just, you know, a bunch of the, the local protest family and they're literally a water balloon fight broke out. And next thing I know, I was like dodging balloons left or right, like nobody was safe. So that was one of the rewarding moments, but um, going down there and seeing what was going on, hearing the conversations um, and just trying to, you know, I mean, the camera can't lie, you know, unless you're sitting there photoshopping, but that's not something we do when it comes to visual journalism. So just trying to tell the stories, trying to capture the stories, look for those key moments that I feel like weren't being um, necessarily portrayed um, on the mainstream media or social media. Like my biggest pet peeve to the point where like it pissed me off a few times. It's like, you know, you'd see, and they always say, don't read the comments or whatever. But sometimes it's hard to not get sucked in there, but like, it'd be like, you know, they're, they're tearing up the city and the city's burning down, and, you know, all this stuff, the, the, the rioting. And I think the, when it first, when things first started happening at the end of May, there was a couple um, rough nights, but for the most part, you know, it was protesting, there was chanting going on. Um, you know, the police were with, you know, they were up against the protesters. There were some arrests made, but I never seen like rioting or burning down or total destruction, what was being portrayed. So the more I've seen that, the more I wanted to get out there and document. And then it's like, you know, if, you know, I'd see then the conversation come up, like, look, this is, this is what's going on out there. So, um, there was one night that I thought was pretty powerful too. Um, so we had another, there's another local photographer, Tyler Girth, Um, and he was killed down there at the square. It was, it was a random act of, I don't know random, but like there was a, there was somebody there at the square and he got kicked out and he came back and he had a gun, I think, or he took a gun from one of the other protesters and he fired into the crowd and this photographer got killed. I went out there later that night, um, <clears throat> just to document. And this was the first time I seen it, but there was like a line of black police officers and a line of the black protesters. Um, and they were talking, they were, there, there was, there were very emotional conversations, but I, you know, I just kind of sat back from a distance a little bit, try to take pictures, but just listen to the conversation and, and them trying to convey each other's perspective. And they were actually like listening. They weren't like arguing and shouting at each other. They were, you know, like one of the protesters, Brian, he would speak, you know, and then the officer, I think he was like a captain or chief. He was, you know, the lead guy down there, you know, he was sitting there listening and then he kind of rebuttal back to him, like, look, this is our position, you know, and I was, I'm in from the same streets you are. And, you know, take that, take that uniform off. I'm black, just like you are. You know, there was, it was, it was a moment of like, where I could see that people were trying to understand one another. You know, it wasn't like, you know, they're all rioters and protesters and causing trouble. And it wasn't, you know, like all 
fuck the police and a cab and all this other crap. It, they were actually like two groups of humans with opposing opinions and views trying to see eye to eye and understand one another. So, um, that was, uh, that was probably one of the more powerful moments. And then like, even to even go like a little bit further in the layer. So something that kind of noticed, I was talking to uh, one of my friends the other night about this. Um, so like during like so I'm Latino so like in Louisville Kentucky it's, it's kind of it's pretty much binary I feel like you got you know it's, you got like a black community white community you got a Latin community here but there's not really a Chicano community um, but like down at the protests it's mostly you know um, Black Lives Matter and then your white allies but like sometimes I would see things that just kind of didn't sit right with me um, so that night like there was a white protester behind the line of the black protesters shouting with the megaphone, you know, like he was the one yelling, fuck the police and a cab and don't talk to them, like instigating. And that just kind of sat weird with me because it's like, here you guys have, here you have these two group of people that's at the heart of these protests, this movement, this, this, com this conflict, but you got almost like an outside agitator, like, you know, why won't you let these people talk? So that's, that's where I kind of, you know, got to see how deep the layers go yeah i mean um, it's it's definitely a and that, like a i'm not you know i'm not black or white and that just didn't feel it just didn't seem right with like like what what's going on like this didn't i can't explain the words it just didn't seem right to me it didn't set right my my heart so but you know what like that's understandable the situation is a deeply nuanced one um tony i, I want to go to you a lot of your work um, shows you engaging with people in such an intimate way mm -hmm. in the middle of a protest. Um, how are you able to do that? How are you able to um, capture those moments where you see the beautiful complexities of Black life in the midst of a, of a tragedy? Well, I mean, that's a great question. Um, um, we hear a little feedback. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, when you speak of of shooting last year's protests, um, my hat is all to everyone, first of all, who shot during the middle of a pandemic, which is like unheard of. Um, so, you know, that takes a lot of courage, but it also takes a lot of courage from those individuals who saw fit to go out and protest for this change that we have been uh, yearning for so many years as a people. It just goes to show also when you look at um, the killings of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, and countless others, you think that, you know, we're, that's just how angry and upset we are as a race of people. That's also how upset and angry our white allies are. Uh, one of the most encouraging things for me is that I've gotten so many messages from people all over the world uh, basically saying, hey, you know, we're glad that you guys are out there documenting this. Um, this is this is well overdue and just giving words of encouragement. Um, but back to your original question, I, you know, it comes with experience, Vanessa. Uh, it comes with knowing our people, right? Uh, reading body language. Um, and that's something that I think as, as black and brown photographers, we may have an advantage on, you know, when it comes to our white colleagues understanding our people, understanding our people's emotions, uh, not trying to disparage our people in any way. So I'm always looking to humanize our people, right? Uh, whether they are black or white, anyone who's at the protest, I'm trying to humanize them, especially us, because we for so long have been looked at as being less than, right? And there's been so many negative stereotypes, not only written about us, but you know, we still have movies and films about us in a negative light. So it's our responsibility as recorders of history to record the facts. And like Gary said, there were some agitators at a lot of these protests, but by and large in DC, I can speak to uh, mostly peace, peaceful protests uh, for the majority of the summer and the majority of the time that I shot last year. Um, so yeah, you know, you just try to get in and, 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 and I try to catch those seminal moments uh, those powerful moments, emotions. Um, and yeah, and, and, and that's pretty much how I go about it when I go out and shoot. And obviously, you know, I think for, for myself and a lot of my close friends, you know, 
again, we, we pray. I know I pray every day before I go out um, for cover um, because you just never know what we may encounter once we're out there in the streets. Uh, we've encountered Proud Boys. We've encountered, uh, you know, Trump, uh, pro-Trump uh, protesters. Uh, so all of these different factions you have, you know, coming together uh, at Black Lives Matter Plaza can can definitely provide a, a, a kettle pot, so to speak. So um, that's pretty much how I approach it. You know, um, I think that that's so spot on. I I find myself personally when I was photographing in the streets of St. Louis, looking around myself and immediately seeing like these are my brothers, they're my, my sisters, they can be my dad, dad, my mom, my cousin, my friend. And so um okay. and so being very mindful about um if, if it were me on the other side of the camera, like how would I want to show up in the world? And thinking about that. My next question is to Chris. Chris, can you hear me? Am I coming in okay? It's coming in a little choppy right now. I don't know if you have or not. Okay. Let's see. What about now? Nah, it's not perfect. It's like it's a lag now. Okay. So on my end, it, it sounds fine, but it seems like you oh, were just, you were just good. I'm yeah. good. Yeah, you're good. You're much better right there. Stay right there. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I will Don't stay move. right here. <laughs> um, Chris, I, I remember earlier you were talking about a lot of your work um, seeks to provide a counter narrative. Is this is in providing a counter narrative? Is that one of the ways that you um, engage in visual vis, visual activism in your work? Yeah, of, of course, of course. Like, I just want to tell the story of what's really happening. That's like the main goal at any time that I'm out. Like, what's really what really went down? Whether it it wasn't pleasant or if it was real pleasant. Like, I just want to show what goes down because a lot of these. Uh, other images that I've been seeing can show it can show us looking kind of kind of crazy at these protests when in actuality it it don't even really be the protesters that initially started you know the movement. Um, right. I remember early on when, um, when they was doing the rioting and stuff that was people that weren't even from New York when they were doing that. These people from neighboring states, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So, but. If somebody photographed that and you not and you don't know that you're not in the crowd, you're not being well informed, you, you would believe that. You know what I mean? So I want to make sure they see the other side of whatever the news is probably going to show you or whatever they want to promote for commercialism, however they get down. Mm. Well, you know, definitely black pain and black rage is sensationalized, right? And mm -hmm. and and it it sells. It's uncomfortable, but it's true. Um, yeah, but when they, sell that, when they push that though, you know, not to cut you off. I'm sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead. When they, when they push that, it kind of gives fuel to you know to racist individuals or people who just don't understand how Black Lives Matter is moving or the Black experience, like whatever preconceived notions they have. It just pushes that narrative, and like at some point, you just gotta get tired of that. Oh yeah, it's. I mean, I I agree with you. It's it's exhausting. Um, how do you? Um, Chris and or Tony, um, how do you remain encouraged in a situation that perpetuates a negative black stereotypes visually? Hmm. Tony, you can jump in. I'm going to take it. Um, well, that's that's a great question that, that definitely provides some thought. I think for me, um, I think back at like our ancestors, right? I think of the struggles that they've all had to endure. Um, I think about people like my father, who uh, was an EEO officer, was a civil rights activist uh, back in his day in the in the 50s and 60s and 70s here in D.C. So we stand on their shoulders. Um, they did not give up. They still persevered. And so I think it's just only right for us to continue that same 
struggle, that same uh, legacy, if you will, um, even though we know that there's a lot of work to be done, there has been progress. Um, however, we 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 saw the ugliness, if you will, again, of America last year. Um, if you think back and kind of contextualize last year, this this generation of Black Lives Movement started with the killing of Trayvon Martin. Absolutely. And that was that was seven years ago. So to think back seven years, we're still being brutalized by the police. We're still being marginalized. We're still uh, being oppressed. So there's no way that we can give up. We have to get out and record history. We have to document. We have to tell these stories. Um, this is how the next generation will learn about what we actually went through. Just like when we look at images of Dr. King, when we look at images of uh, John Lewis, uh, you know, we have to continue and carry that torch. It's our responsibility, I believe, to do so. I, I agree. What about you, Chris? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I totally agree with Tone. Definitely agree with Tone. I think it's definitely important to to like understand the activism behind it because we are still chanting things that were around the time of when my mom was young, when her mom was young. Like this is this is generational. This just keeps going on. And you know, I'm really adamant on trying to change that for my daughters in the future. I don't want them to have to to still have to march. You know what I mean? Yeah. Have to still say Black Lives Matter. I want it to be a whole new a whole a whole new future for them. So they don't have to do what I'm doing, what my mom did, what my grandmother did, rest her soul. Like, I don't really want that for them because this is a lot to take in. I know you guys probably could agree, like as photographers, after photographing a lot of these events, it's a lot to take back home with you. You know, like after you got to go back in the computer, go back through these images, it's a lot. That, that's a lot. And when you realize when you're that close to the work and you're seeing your experience play out and knowing that any given day, like it could be us, too. You know, that's a lot to take in. So I just want to make sure I'm part of the, the good change of history for this to really work. I love yeah, that. I love that's that. A, that's important. I mean, just yeah. to touch on what Chris said, I feel him on that. Like when we get home and we upload these images, it's a lot to unpack. Yes. You know, we're looking at, you know, for us, we could have been that, you know, we could have been George Floyd. You know, we have sisters, mothers, aunts daughters that could have been Breonna Taylor. You know, we have male relatives who could have been Ahmaud Arbery. Um, I remember being down at the uh, protest one day and I just I just started crying. You know, I mean, the emotions hit me that much. Because it was just hard to see our people once again in this constant struggle. Right. For racial equality. And to think that in 2020, now 2021, we had a brother who was killed in cold blood by the police. And there's still questions surrounding why he was in his circumstance. So that situation is just mind boggling. You know, right. we're always the victims. Uh, even when we're killed, somehow <laughs> or another, we're seen as the victim in some sort of way. So right. it's emotional. And, and and like Chris said, it, it's just a lot to unpack. Um, you know, at, at at times you feel like you need to sit down on someone's couch for real. That that is true, Gary. How how do you take care of yourself after um, photographing after photographing in, in, in Louisville with everything that happened with Brianna Taylor? Um. I mean, just to piggyback off of Tone and Chris, it is a lot to unpack and, you know, just like really like because as you're going through these images and culling them, I mean, you're you're literally reliving that experience, um, whether it's a good moment or an intense moment. And I mean, sometimes, you know, there'd be days or there'd be times that there would be not times. Um, some of the stuff I would document when I go through it, like I would just have to step away for a little bit, honestly, and just try to deescalate. Cause there, you know, there'd be times when I'd be going through it and I get really upset and then, you know, I'll, I'll text or start chatting with my buddies online and, you know, and then, you know, I might start, you know, listening to music or something. And then, you know, it just kind of avalanches, you know, I remember a couple of times going through the images, I threw on some, I grew up on Tupac, so I threw on some Tupac and then it's like, I was getting more emotional. I was like, okay, maybe this ain't the best, <laughs> the best music to be listening to right now. 
Um, <laughs> but just trying to like, just trying to like understand your feelings. Cause like, it was a lot of, there's a lot of mental stuff going, going on with me personally, you know, last year. And then just trying to recognize, you know, the whole, you know, the toll it can take on you documenting it and going through it and reliving it. So just, you know, identifying, you know, these triggers and trying to have like safe and healthy coping mechanisms in place, like good catches, you know? Yeah. So that's, uh, that's how I did, you know, and just, you know, and then, you but in the end, it's like, you know, it's like, I'm doing this for a good thing, you know, I'm just out there, you know, on my own freelancing, you know, this one picture could change somebody's life or change, you know, change the narrative or bring truth to something that happened, you know, and then if that's all it took, you know, then, you know, I feel like I did a good job. You know, I did my part. So. Right. I think, you know, sometimes we don't think about as photographers that we are really engaging in something that is deeply traumatic. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, like when, when you're out there, um, you just know how important it is. So you're just photographing away. Um, and then it becomes almost haunting when you're looking in the eyes of protesters because they could easily be your eyes. Mm-hmm. Um, and so like your lens has to serve as that camera or as that witness. Um, another question that I have for you guys, and Tone, you can answer this first. Do you find yourself in your work trying to prove that communities of color are not as um, are not as barbaric or not as um, um, messed up as uh, the white gaze um, portrays it to be, or um, are you more concerned with having people of color reimagine themselves in a different way? Uh, I think I approach it from your first question, and that is from the standpoint of humanizing us as people. Okay. Plain and simple. Um, I think that's most important. Not to say that the second question isn't, because I think we need to see ourselves in a great light as well. But I think, moreover, the world needs to know that we are human, that we have a soft spot, um, that we love on people uh, just like everyone else, that we want the same things out of life. Um, when I think of, for example, uh, George Floyd, you know, aside from us being photographers and going to shoot these protests, and Chris and Gary, you guys can probably speak to this. I see myself as being like a George Floyd in terms of like that could have happened to me. So that's traumatic in and of itself without even going to a protest to shoot. Right. You follow what I'm saying? So you have to you have to deal with that. And then you have to say, OK, let me put my photographer cap on and go down and capture, you know, these particular uh, events. So, again, you know, it was just. 200 years ago when we were considered three fifths of a human and I'm talking about black folks. So I believe it's, it's, it's important and it's imperative of us to go out and document our people in the best light, because a lot of our folks get photographed in a disparaging way. You have a lot of photographers that come into these cities, they shoot homeless people, they shoot folks that are down and out, this, that, or the other. And the fact is, is that there are homeless people throughout all the races. Um, when people talk about, well, if black lives matter so much, how come uh, there's so much black on black crime? And, you know, my answer to that is crime is based on proximity. You know, 80 percent of the white folks that are killed in this country are killed by other white people. So in essence, there's no such thing as black on black crime. You know, we don't call it white on white crime. So these are these are negative stereotypes that we have to continue to get from up under. And that will only occur, in my honest opinion, if photographers of color are out there covering and documenting these demonstrations and protests, period. Now, that's true. That's true. I'm with that. I think I I think my work leans more to showing the the resiliency of black people um, at, at a lot of these protests, because you you've seen you you've seen images and seen videos of 
of us crying already. You've seen us angry. You've seen us get beat down. Like, but they never want to show you the rise to get back up to push through. That that's true saying that we really got to work. You know, twice as hard to get half. You know what I mean? Like that shines through with everything that we do. I feel, and the resiliency that it, that comes with that is usually overlooked. Unless you're in the black community, of course we see it, we know it. You know, we we got black mamas, black daddies. We know, we we know resiliency. But there's people that that, that don't have that experience. They don't know, and I want right. to show them that. Gary, um, as as a a Chicano photographer, do you do you find yourself in the work that that you've done in St. Louis when you're documenting um, the movement? Did you find any deep relations? to to that um, body of work that you created in terms of your in, identity? In St. Louis or? No, Louisville? no, no, in Louisville, in Louisville. Okay, I thought you said St. Louis. No. <laughs> um, you said, did I, within the work, did I identify with any one piece, piece of work? Yeah. Is that what you're asking? Did, did you, were you able to identify um, yourself in the movement? The reason why I'm asking that is because I think that something that um, goes overlooked as well is the systematic um, discrimination that happens towards Chicanos and, Lat and Latinos in this country. And so, yeah. I, I'm sorry, go ahead, finish. No, and finish. so did, did you find yourself asking yourself those kinds of questions when you were looking through your body of work? Yeah, um, like when I was out there, it's like, you know, like, like I'm not black, so I can't fully, truly understand the black experience, but I can empathize with it being brown because we have our own set of uh, troubles and injustices. And we've got, you know, our whole social justice movements, too. Um, and just as you see, like, you know, a lot of the. Um, you know, I hate to, I really hate to say this term, but you see a lot of names in the black community that are that become hashtags. And I've heard conversations. I've even had co conversations like don't want to become the next hashtag. Um, mm. But, you know, with me being, you know, Chicano, you know, in the Latin community, um, you know, there's there's a whole, you know, there's lives that are lost in that community, too. Like Sean Monterosa, we, the sisters actually just came out to Louisville on the um, commemoration of when Brianna was killed, um, Andres Carado, who was killed by the LA sheriffs. Um, there's, you know, there's, so I was able, I was able to relate because I could, I, you know, I could empathize with what's going on in the black community with what I know and understand in the brown community. Yeah. So even though it's like, it's different, like Louisville, it's like different. Like I don't, I never really felt like a home, like like Louisville's home, but it, like as far as like being Chicano, like there's never really been a place for me to identify. And, like, oh, yeah, these are my peeps here. But, like, you know, we got a Latin community. Um, but nice. predominantly, yeah, predominantly it's, you know, I feel like it's black and white. Um, so, and then just, like, understanding the, the 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 parallels between the two. I mean, that's just, you know, more motivation for me to get out and document. Like, you know, I can, you know, I can be an ally in that sense. You know, I can go out there and document and have these people's backs. And, you know, there's another group of us photographers, you know, I met like three of them out there last year, became pretty good friends with. So um, we all would like link up when we go out there and kind of do like safety checks, like, hey, I'm here, I'm I'm leaving for the night or whatever. So just kind of build some camaraderie that way. So that's, that's, that's amazing. Yeah, so so. We're, we're going to um, go into your work a little bit. Um, so first, we're going to look at the work of Gary Berrigan. Um, and I, I specifically chose this photograph um, as, as the, the guest curator because I think that it is essential to uh, see that there is a common thread um, in terms of certain experiences of people of color in America, right? Um, whether you're indigenous or you're Latino or Latina, Chicano or, Chica or, or Chicano, um, African American, a black immigrant, whatever, there is um, a sense of otherness that exists 
um, when you when you exist when you live in America. And so this photograph to me was extremely powerful. It's in East Los Angeles, and you have um, Gary. Correct me if I'm wrong, but he's a brown beret, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. And then you have another gentleman um, with the Black Lives Matter movement, and they're they're fist to fist. And yep. so definitely speaking to um, just the camaraderie and the universal struggle for justice and freedom as a black and brown person in this country. Um, the next photograph is a photograph that Gary chose that he wanted to speak to. Mm, I don't think that one was it, but I can speak on that one. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so this was, this is more symbolic to me. Um, this this was the morning, so the park was getting ready. That's in Justice Square, and that's uh, the Breonna Taylor mur- mural. And there was that morning, they were getting ready to clear the the square out, and that mural was sent down to the Roots One Hundred and One um, African American Museum down the street. So uh, I think this was like seven or eight in the morning. I knew this was the last time, like the last sunrise. The last time the sun would actually rise on this mural. So I found like a lot of symbolism in there. So I was just down there hanging out. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of people. And then um, this gentleman came through and he was, you know, he came through and started chanting Justice, Justice for Brianna and Brianna Taylor and Breway, all the chants that, you know, that are um, uh, specific to Louisville and, um, and Brianna. Um, so, I, he just stood in front of me and started chanting and raised his fist and I just captured that image and fell in love with it. So it just kind of encapsulates the whole movement as in one image, I feel like. I actually agree. It does it does capture it in a very powerful way. Yeah, and it's just I mean, it was just like a very beautiful morning, just quiet, peaceful. Um, so hmm. wow. Um, the, the next work that we're going to look at is, thank you for sharing, Gary. You're welcome. The next work we're going to look at is Chris's work. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, Chris, can, can you speak to that? Oh, man, that's the, I entitled that one, The Pushback, um, mm. for obvious reasons. Um, this day, I was part of this protest. I think it started in Harlem made his way down to through 42nd Street and then ended up, I think, at Washington Square Park, if memory serves me correctly. And the police, they were doing these things where they were, they were randomly rush the crowd, grab who they could grab, and back up. This has been something they've been doing all 2020. I don't know about all the other states, but I know in New York, they was really getting down like this. When they went to make another rush, this gentleman pushed through everybody to push them back, put himself down on the line, to make sure that nobody else got hurt because they were really hurting people, dragging people across the ground, slamming people, men and women getting body slammed. So he put himself out there to, to kind of prevent that from, from happening again. Um, and it's, it's by himself. And I think it's a beautiful symbol of like, like it's enough. Like we're just gonna just keep fighting back. There's, you're not gonna just keep thinking you can rush us, take the numbers and, and do whatever you wanna do. Like, nah, that's enough of that. And it starts, you know, it always starts with one. Right. Once this gentleman put himself on the line, the crowd got right. You're not you're not taking nobody else. Wow. Wow. Um, I remember when I first saw this image um, and I was completely blown away. Um, And one of the big things that stood out to me was just his audacity. Um, And and I, (laughs) you know, like when when you're saying that enough is enough. Um, I think that it takes deep courage and, and just bravery to say that mm-hmm. and in, in, in a country and in a system that um, literally kills black bodies, right? So it, it, it was almost like being like self-sacrificial in a way mm-hmm. for him to go ahead and engage with the police officers like that. And um the other thing that was that was uncanny though was 
You know, if you didn't see his, I think he has on a fitted, if you didn't see his hat, but you see the interaction that the cops are having with this black man, it makes you think of the 1950s, the 1940s, right? And and so this this um, re, replaying of history now, mm-hmm. um, it's, it's a deeply, deeply profound picture. Um, the next photograph. Can, can I say something real quick about this photograph? Yes, yes, please do. This is a powerful photograph, Chris. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Yeah. Looking at the resistance of this one individual against, I don't know, 20 or so police officers. But the thing that captures my attention in this image more so than anything, Chris, is if you look at the background, there's two one way signs. And to me, those one way signs are symbolic of America today, where you have one faction of folks going in one direction and one you have another faction of folks going in a different direction. Great image, bro. Thank you. I wow. appreciate it. This also goes back to what I was saying um, previously about the resiliency of like black people. Like, that's right. Look at them. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's that's an act of favor. Um, the next image is so I I remember selecting this image, and you know there is this um, almost there's like this fetish, fetish fetishizing of watching the killing of black bodies in America, right? So we watch. George Floyd lose his life. Um, they released videos of Breonna Taylor getting shot. Um, they released videos of Sandra Bland experiencing what she experienced. Mm-hmm. Um, it's almost like this public lynching is so embedded within the American landscape to literally sit there and watch people die, watch black people die, is a common act. Mm-hmm. That happens in America, um, and it, and it made me think about. Do you guys remember um, the riot on the Capitol Hill where there was a, a female service member who lost her life? Yes. And and there really wasn't much sharing of her body, of those series of events that happened, um, and and they were very blatant with saying that. Um, it's in respect to his or her family, right? And so it makes me think about where is that common courtesy for someone else's family, for a black man's family, his children, like for example, George Floyd's children can type it in and see their father be killed. And, And when I saw this image, you know, it made me think about us being so consumed with videotaping injustices because it keeps us distant from it, but it also feeds the need of the American psyche to engage in this voyeuristic behavior of watching the mm-hmm. killing of a black body. So I, I really thought that this, this image was, it, it, it was very profound and had a lot of messaging to it. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you, sir. It Thank definitely, it, it, I wanted it to really speak to, you know, that is to the fact that it's always on the news, you know, our lives. Like, that's that's a fear of mine, um, especially one that kind of came to me during photographing these protests. Like, um, I don't want to, I don't want my camera to be mistake, mistaken as a weapon or something like that for mm-hmm. me to end up, you know, losing my life because the internet is so open. And I, I, mm-hmm. I would never want my kids to have to be able to Google my dad's death or something. You understand what I'm saying? Like, I don't mm-hmm. want that to be a thing it shouldn't it shouldn't be like that but unfortunately if that was to happen i feel like it would be yeah you know i feel like it, if somebody would watch it would be going live on somebody's facebook or instagram or something like that and and the end of it all like we just want you to what we want you to, to see on this national level is that our lives matter is that's what we want you to see but you want to just see whatever it is you want to see that's going to help further perpetuate whatever thoughts you have, whatever you think of us, whatever. It's not right, but you just, you know, you're not stepping in to make any change. I know one of the first protests that I photographed um, early last year was um, in Union Square. And I tried to stop a few people from getting arrested. I got hit with bikes, all types of stuff by the police. And you you have to start realizing like, 
yeah, I, I'm I'm here with a with this camera, but at the end of the day, I'm I'm black first and foremost before any of this, and they can take me out just cause they they feel like it, you know. So right. this is this these images also remind us to myself to make sure that I I, I kind of stay in check myself. Wow, thank you for sharing that, Chris. Um, lastly, we're gonna look at the work of of Tony Mobley. Um, so this is this is a photograph that I chose for this evening to discuss. Um, it, it's such a precious photograph, and that when you're looking at the people surrounding this couple, um, you see a sense of community. Um, you see them affirming uh, the life of her unborn son. Um, but then you also see the father holding um, his, his partner's stomach, right? And right. him understanding that he has to protect his child before he even comes out of the womb. And he has to make sure that he's safe. And then it also, as a mother myself of a black boy, um, it, it's also gut wrenching because I know that these are thoughts that I have, right, about my own son. Um, and seeing her um, carry such a beautiful life, it makes me think about at what point do beautiful black children go from being these um, curious, majestic little beings to being viewed as, as a threat. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, that's so. That's so true. And, that's and so true. Next, I was just gonna. I was just gonna yeah, add to that. Good. Just to. Yeah, I was just gonna say. You know, when you think about life, uh, for me, I think about like one of the precious gifts in life is to actually have life, is to give birth. Um, I'm the father of two. Uh, young ladies now, uh, no longer girls, but for us as black people to think that we have to have these thoughts uh, for our future kids. There are a lot of people now who don't even want to have kids in today's culture. And I think that it's, it's sad, but it speaks to the times. Um, we're the only race and and I shouldn't say that only because I'll let Gary speak for the Latino and Chicano race, but I know for black families, we have to constantly speak to our children about being safe as they drive to the mall, to school, to a store, unlike any other race, you understand? And that in itself adds an extra layer of not only pressure, but it's kind of, conflicting to have to send those messages to your kids at such an early age because yeah. the children they don't understand yeah. they want to be they want to be children right they want to be kids um so when i look at this image which to me is is just so powerful it just again brings home that same thought how protected will our unborn kings be today knowing what we still have to endure knowing that we still are uh, subjected to police brutality, uh, systemic oppression, social injustice, all of these things, right? Uh, in the middle of a pandemic, no less. Right. So to me, this was, uh, I thank them for allowing me to snap this image. This was a, a powerful image to me that just spoke volumes. Um, and again, I don't know if we always think about these things, but seeing this young lady and this brother with this baby to be, wow, it's just, you're right. We, we want to know is, is his, does his life matter? Yeah. You know, and that's, that's the million dollar question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and the next image um, is, is something that, you know, during the protests of 2020, so many people chanted, this. Um, can you tell me a little bit about this image, Tony? Where were you? What were you thinking? Yeah, so on this particular day, this was like the last image I shot on this given day. Uh, this happened a few blocks up from Black Lives Matter Plaza. And, uh, you know, when you leave the protest, you know, you're full of emotions. Um, you know, you may cry, you may be sad. You see other people, you know, going through the motions, so to speak. 
in terms of what we had to endear on that particular day. Um, but when I looked up as I was walking to my car that day, I saw this brother on this bridge and I saw this sign. And it was to me, Vanessa, just a reminder that we're still in this. We're still strong. We're still resilient. And we're still here to effect change no matter what has happened, right? Mm -hmm. And so when I saw this brother on this bridge, it was almost like he was speaking to my spirit, you know, to say, hey, brother, you know, don't get down on yourself, you know? Um, and so when I saw this brother again in this, this particular setting, those are the thoughts that came to my mind. Wow, wow. So we, we, ha we have a question from Henry on YouTube, and he says, to the naked eye, all protests look the same. But as photographers, you each find ways to show it differently. Can you speak to your individual approaches to make unique photos of these events? I'll start with you, Gary. Um, I wouldn't say I have a, a unique approach that would make my, I guess, try to make mine stand out from everybody else's. That's not really a goal of mine is to try to create something unique or something that's going to be like, oh, that's a Gary B protest image. Uh, my whole thing is just going to document the truth and what it looks like. Um, you know, if, you know, I might throw, you know, if I, I might reposition myself to, you know, try to throw like an artistic angle to it or composition. Um, you know, but then you're kind of getting into the art of like photographs. But, you know, when I'm in the moment out there, I'm, you know, just looking for moments and just trying to capture those moments. So um, I don't really, you know, try to do something to make my work stand out. You know, that's not a goal of mine. So I can't really speak that much on that question. You know, in post processing, I might, you know, add like a slight color grade or something, depending on how I feel and the mood for the day, you know. I think we talked about it in class on whether, you know, I do like color versus a black and white image. And it's just kind of something that just whatever the images talk to me, just, you know, sometimes I feel like monochromatic. Sometimes I feel like color is just there's no rhyme or reason to it. It's just what's feeling here. Thank you, Gary. What about you, Chris? Oh, man. Um... I don't know. Um, I, like I said earlier, you know, I like to focus on like the resiliency. So because I've noticed uh, early on that a lot of the, the other photographers that were coming out to photograph a lot of these protests, a large number of them were really looking for what um, I would probably title as like trauma porn. You know, they're just looking for the hot shot, the the obvious and more times than not cliche shots. Um, you can get those. That's fine. They also tell the story. But I think what makes us photographers is finding a different way to still get that message across, you know, and and I think that's where the individuality comes in between um, the eyes of different photographers. So when I go out, I'm in, like I'm taking everything that I've ever learned about creating images with me from books that I look at from some of my heroes like Gordon Parks, Roy De Carava, you know, W. Eugene Smith, these people like and I try to find a more humanistic approach to these scenes mm -hmm. to show and the resiliency to show how people are really reacting in these moments, moments that might May even, maybe even go unnoticed if you're there in the action in the moment, you don't notice, you know, like that's the job that we have as photographers to be able to see through all that and find those moments. So I think I just look for those real humanistic moments. Absolutely. And, and what about you, Tony? Um, Gary, you had something you want to say? Oh, you're, you're muted. Um, something that I just kind of want to piggyback off of Chris where he's talking about like the, the stereotype shots. That's something like that I learned last year, you know, through the, through the class about, um, the white gaze and understanding it. So there'd be moments out there that I would avoid capturing. Cause I knew there was somebody there that would capture it. And, you know, a black photographer, you know, would I feel like has more of a right to tell that story versus, you know, somebody who's you know brown and kind of essentially on the outside so i think you know knowing when to give the respect to those stories that need to be told by black people you know and then the same token i've been out there and i've seen like white photographers and white press like step in front of 
black photographers to get shots. So I think that's something I would yield to that I did yield to. So okay. I, I think that's important. I think that's important for anybody out there documenting the movement is, you know, knowing what stories to capture and what story you want to tell, and what story you have the right to tell. I agree. And, and what about you, Tom? We're going to we're going to wrap this up with you. Yeah, no, that's good. Uh, so I think that uh, for myself, you know, when you're shooting a protest, there's so many moving parts, right? Um, and so many fleeting moments. Um, so you really have to be uh, on your game. You have to know how to anticipate. Uh, for myself, I try to shoot images of, of, of individuals and signs that will evoke, uh, hopefully change, um, that will hopefully change some people's hearts. Um, obviously, I know what the, the message is of today. So I'm looking for signs that speak to these times, in essence. Um, I'm also, like Chris stated earlier, I shoot a lot of behind the scenes uh, images as well. So I'm not always up front. I'm shooting perhaps that guy or that girl that's off to the side uh, protesting in their own sort of way. You know, you have people that are dancing, you have people that are singing, uh, folks that, that may be actually chanting. So there's so many different ways of protesting. There was a brother one day who was actually, he was a barber. And he was uh, actually in the middle of the plaza uh, cutting Black Lives Matter into the back of another brother's head. You know, so there's different ways of conveying protests. So I'm looking for all of those moments uh, with the hopes that when folks see these, you know, they will evoke some sort of spirit of change, some sort of change of heart. Uh, and again, like Chris and Gary said earlier, to humanize us, because, again, to me, that's the number one thing, man. We. We're not humanized enough. We're, we're just looked at as other than and not right. as the black people that we are. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, this, this is the conclusion of the talk. Um, I thank you guys so much for participating. Um, this, the work that you produce is, is absolutely amazing. Uh, you know, the main reason why I have you guys here is because. I admire you guys, I admire your work, I admire your tenacity. Um, you know, like, honestly, what we did last year, what we continue to do is creating history, is um, documenting history, and hopefully I'm creating the space for those that are coming behind us to have something to look to. Um, and also, hopefully, to pave the way for other black and brown um, young people to enter the field and document their own community and their own stories. So now we're going to turn over to Mike, um, who's going to make a closing statement. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you, Vanessa, Tony, Chris, Gary, uh, uh, to everyone who's uh, watching on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn. Um, much appreciated. Uh, great conversation. Um, way to kick off the uh, the series of panels that we have for the Black Summer Exhibition. Um, speaking of which, um, our next panel will be on Monday, April 5th um, at 7 p.m. Um, with Vanessa again and uh, uh, four additional photographers from the Black Summer Exhibition, um, Malik Marble, Kay Hickman, John Jerry, and Dee Dwyer, uh, talking about the role and experiences of Black photographers and um, I would encourage you to uh, visit the exhibition. It's a web exhibition. It's the Gage Gallery's first uh, online virtual exhibition. It's at roosevelt.edu slash Black Summer. Um, we'll put that in the uh, chat and uh, you can visit that. Hopefully there's some great resources that we just put up this week um, on the page as well. Um, and um, Follow us on Facebook, um, follow Vanessa, Tony, Chris, Gary on Instagram, on Twitter, um, won't, won't go wrong doing that. And there'll be a third panel uh, in April. We are working on the, uh, the date for that uh, sometime in the mid to late April um, with three more photographers from the exhibition, John Cherry, Doug Barrett, and Henry Danner. Uh, that will be about visual journalism and telling diverse stories. So uh, once again, thank you for being here and um, follow us on Facebook for more updates. Have a good evening.